this month's podcast features Dr. Michael Maripati, the Dean of Academic Affairs at Cambridge College. Dr. Maripati has spent many years working with online program management. He has spearheaded numerous online degree programs and has vast cultural knowledge in the world of education and beyond. In this podcast, you'll hear how artificial intelligence will become a teachable aspect in all disciplines. Using AI as a tool crosses all disciplines. At this juncture, it it touches on every discipline that that most colleges would be able to offer. So in that regard, yes, we are going to have to teach our students how to use AI. That no matter how good artificial intelligence gets, humans will always have the final say. I think there's always going to be a human element. How, how do these numbers, how do these figures, how do these fact, facts apply to me and my yeah. situation? I think that's yeah. always going to be needed. And how science fiction often accurately predicts our technological advancements. How, how many times do you go on Facebook or you see a meme somewhere where they've got George Jetson and some device that he was using back in that old cartoon that we all have in our pockets today? The cell phone or something else, that does, some other mobile technology. Uh, that, was the, that was the fodder of science fiction at one time. And we're there now. It's something that has actually happened. This podcast was created by JFY Networks, a Boston based nonprofit provider of online learning resources, training, and support. JFY's individualized self paced curriculum helps raise individual and school performance by recovering learning loss and reaching and maintaining grade level skills. For JFY Networks, I'm Greg Cunningham. Dr. Michael Maripati has an extensive and diverse background in education, from leadership positions at the high school level to pioneering work in online college programs to his current leadership position at Cambridge College. During his professional journey, he has helped develop numerous online courses and programs at the college level. In a recent conversation with JFY's executive director, Gary Kaplan, Dr. Maripati discussed the latest developments in artificial intelligence and how they may impact education, work, and society in general. Mike, thank you very much for sitting down with us. We have been carrying on this conversation for uh, many years now about the future of education, the present, the present of education, the most recent, obviously, the most recent uh, big topic to show up on the education marquee is artificial intelligence, uh, good old AI. What do you think? Uh, where do you think we're at right now? I mean, you've been with artificial intelligence. Where do you think it's going in the next five minutes or five years? Well, that's an interesting question, Gary. Uh, artificial intelligence has been around for a very long time. Probably it can we could trace its roots back 40 or 50 years if we wanted to be uh, technical about it. And it's gone through a couple different periods of uh, not quite dormancy, but it fell out of favor with funders several times in the early 2000s and, and again just a, a 10 years ago or so. And as a result, it sort of morphed or, or, or went by different names that, that your audience would probably recognize. But the latest iteration of AI that has really caught everyone's attention is uh, ChatGPT and other similar programs. And really that's what's changing the face of education. We've been using AI in education for quite some time. Uh, anytime you go on a college or university website and a little chat bot pops up on the side that says, I can answer all your questions about XYZ University, uh, that's AI. So it isn't as though we're a complete stranger to it, but this latest iteration, this latest uh, product or program, however you want to describe it, is really what's causing all the stir. And it's very much a disruptor in the same way as other things have been disruptors over the years. Just in my career, the last 40 plus years, uh, we've been through the whole um, calculator revolution when we uh, didn't want to use calculators in math class because children wouldn't learn how to compute. And, and then, of course, a few years after that, it was the computer revolution. And we didn't want to have computers in the classrooms because they would take over the function of the teachers or whatever they might do, the harm that they would bring. And now, of course, kids come to school with computers in their backpacks, in their 
phones and on their wrists. So the idea that any one of these things was going to destroy education as we know it, of course, didn't come about. As I'm fond of saying, we don't whittle our own pencils. and We don't scrape our own slates anymore. We've moved past all of that. And so we will, in some ways, move past uh, AI, but I don't think we'll do it without really incorporating it into our the, the whole teaching and learning enterprise. There's just no way around that. So we as a college are wrestling with that right now. I've been in a series of meetings just in the last week, uh, and I've held a series of meetings over the last few months about what AI is going to look like. On the one hand, it's a tremendous time saver. Uh, if I'm a business person and I want to come up with an advertising campaign, an email campaign, business plan, any of those sorts of things, Chat GPT can put those together in a matter of seconds, not even minutes. And they're good. They're, they're, they're just fine. They're usable. And as a matter of fact, if we were to explore a little bit, we've all received emails probably in the last 10 years <laughs> that were generated by some form of artificial intelligence. Uh, some of them are more obvious that they were artificial, but others are not quite so obvious. You wouldn't necessarily know. So from the perspective of our students who are going to live in a world and work in a world five, 10, 20 years down the road, we have to prepare them to use this as a tool because it'll be of tremendous value to them going forward. One of the things though that's obvious about this is that AI produces what AI is going to produce. And if you aren't already familiar with the content that it's producing, uh, it could spew something that's gibberish, not comprehensible. It's not unheard of that it produces things that are racist uh, or things that are overly sarcastic because it's trolling the web is basically where it's getting its information. And much of what's on the web right now is produced by snarky teenagers. So it isn't a you know, big surprise that every once in a while, chat GPT or others like it <laughs> is going to come back with something that's really not something you want to send out to your 10,000 person uh, customer base. So what we need to do in incorporating this as a tool is to teach students how to use it. And really that just goes back to the fundamentals, right? I mean, these are things that you and I have talked about for years, things like critical thinking, things like cogent writing, being able to express yourself in a way that is going to communicate and resonate with the people you're attempting to communicate with. Those skills are going to be absolutely critical going forward in this AI world because it can only do so much. It's getting better and it's going to continue to get better in every successive generation of these programs and software. But it still is going to need a human behind it to make sure that the message is on point and to make sure that the tool is being used as effectively as possible. Do you think we'll be teaching courses uh, in AI uh, soon? Like, you know, we, we're, we're now teaching courses in uh, IT. You know, a, a generation or so ago, IT was the new disruptive technology. And now it's, uh, now it's a major. It's a department. Will there be courses and majors and departments in AI? Well, in one sense, there already are courses and departments and majors in AI, which harken back to the whole computer science field, right? I mean, that's where AI is lives. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, people who are working with AI in terms of the product are already in the field. They're already and, and we'll be educating more and more of them using AI as a tool crosses all disciplines. At this juncture, it, it touches on every discipline that, that most colleges would be able to offer. So in that regard, yes, mm -hmm. we are going to have to teach our students how to use AI. We don't necessarily have to teach them how to create artificial intelligence or create something within the field of artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. But we are going to we are going to have to teach them how to use artificial intelligence effectively in whatever their chosen career or career path might be. So a couple of the uh, obvious complaints about AI is, uh, first of all, the plagiarism issue. What will we do about that? The second big thing is 
it eliminates jobs. Uh, you don't need accountants anymore. You don't need uh, any any uh, replicable, repeatable task. Uh, you don't need any of those people anymore. So it's going to create massive unemployment and students at all levels and P any, anybody who's writing anything, ad copy or a PhD uh, dissertation, is just going to be able to use a AI. You know, there's no need for any original work at all. Well, that's an interesting perspective. As a matter of fact, we had the plagiarism discussion just yesterday uh, at one of our leadership meetings. And if you look at the, the basic definition of plagiarism is taking work that you did not produce and identifying it as your own. And so I would classify AI generated material in the same way I would as if I had gone out and paid someone to write my dissertation or paid someone to write my essay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I told them what to write. I gave uh -huh. them all the parameters. Uh -huh. I explained what the content needed to look like, how long it needed to be. I gave them the number of citations I needed. I provided the parameters of the assignment, but someone else actually wrote it. And so in that regard, that falls under the most common definition of plagiarism. Uh -huh. Now, can we use AI perhaps to produce a draft of something? Sure, in the same way that we would use Wikipedia or some other aggregator to look at an overview of a topic. Most colleges and universities aren't going to accept Wikipedia as a reference source on a, on a reference list, but certainly it's a good place to go if you have no familiarity with a topic and you want to get a broad overview. Much the same, and I, this is definitely going to identify my age, but much the same as when we used to pull a volume of Encyclopedia Britannica off the shelf and read about orangutans. I mean, we, we certainly made good use of those sources, but we were discouraged from citing those as reference or scholarly. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, um, I believe that AI, if, if you simply typed in, I need a five page report on how to create a business model, and you put your name on that and turned it in from whatever AI generated, that to me would be plagiarism. Uh, we want students to be able to read, reflect, and write. Those are the skills that they're going to need to be successful in their careers forever. And so if they skip any of those steps, then that means they'll be not as fully prepared as the next person going forward. If all you're doing is looking for a degree, I mean, we, we're hearing this already, how uh, AI has earned an MBA and they've passed the bar. I mean, it, yes, I mean, clearly, clearly all of those things are possible. That's computers did the same thing back in the day. They also beat Ken Jennings at Jeopardy. I mean, we, we understand that these things are possible. But does that, but that doesn't mean that you'll be the best prepared person for your future and your career if you rely on these tools exclusively. And as far as jobs, every time there's a major disruptor with technology, jobs shift and change. And so uh, I remember speaking with someone uh, years ago when computers first came into the insurance industry. And this woman was in an office with 50 people, mostly women, who did all the menial tasks on paper for a large insurance company. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the first computer hit their desk, she realized that half or more of the people sitting around her were going to be unemployed within sure. six months. And she took a very generous severance package and walked out the door. <laughs> One of the things that this dovetails with, whether it's just serendipitous or not, is the boomer yeah, exiting the scene. You know, we're, we're retiring in large numbers and will continue to do so for the next several years. And so in a sense, instead of replacing us with a warm body, we'll get replaced with um, chat GPT. And that might not be a bad thing. It it might be. Again, it's a, it's a little speculative right now because the foundation of AI is material that someone actually wrote. So at some point, if people cease writing material, then it just becomes AI talking to AI. And uh, not sure how, 
how capable or how able that's going to be in the future to do the kind of jobs that we want to have done. But you're right. Many of the repetitive tasks that, or, or I, I have a neighbor who writes for a sports blog and he said, give AI the box score and they can write the three paragraphs about what happened in the game. So they don't need that, that group of sports writers any longer. You just need somebody to kind of look over AI's shoulder, put the commas in the right place, make sure they got the names right, the statistics are in the right column, and you're you're done in a fraction of the time. Hmm. So uh, back to your original point, yes, I think jobs will be eliminated, but I think they'll also shift uh, as they have in every every time frame. In New York City at the turn of not this past millennium that we all remember, but the one before that that we don't remember, the that op-eds and the editorials and everything else was that the city was going to be buried under horse manure. It was going to be a catastrophe of epic proportions. The city was going to be uninhabitable. Fast forward, what, four years, five years, Mm -hmm. the introduction of the automobile, and suddenly all of that went away. Now, a group of people lost their jobs, the people driving the hansoms and taking care of the horses, the groomers, all of that, the breeders. But in fact, a new industry was spawned that now employs hundreds of thousands of people all around the world. So it just depends on how you look at it, whether you're looking short term mm. or long term, particularly when you're talking about employment statistics. Well, let's let's, let's just try to imagine the next mm, 10, 15 years as ChatGPT and other uh, other iterations uh, become more and more prevalent. What is the labor market going to look like? What are people going to be doing? What I've heard from some of the latest technology is that you'll be able to upload a spreadsheet that's just dense with numbers and categories and labels and all that. And ChatGPT will produce reports. Well, not ChatGPT, but some well, artists, some, some, some function, yeah, will will be able to re- produce reports, written reports, lovely charts, graphs, all those sorts of things. And while that's good, I mean that's that's great. That's a time saver. Again, someone is still going to have to look over the shoulder of AI to make sure that what it's actually saying is, in fact, Mm -hmm. accurate. Because as we know right now, it can sound very uh, sure of itself and make statements that are completely false or have no actual foundation in fact. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that it could make the same mistakes in crunching numbers, uh, just as people can. And then somewhere along the line, some one person is going to have to explain to some other group of people, some other interested parties, what these numbers actually mean. And I don't know that ChatGPT or the other iterations of it are going to be able to take that step of personalizing the information. What does this, they could probably do forecasting, but then there's programs that can do forecasting right now. That's nothing Mm -hmm. new. But as far as the human touch, how does this impact our employees? How does this impact our customer base? How does this impact society? How does this impact the environment? I'm just not sure that any artificial intelligence is sophisticated enough at this point to be able to make what I would consider the human side of the argument. Now, 10 years from now, it might be able to do that. It might be able to do a complete environmental scan and tell you exactly what the carbon footprint is going to look like for every decision that you make within your particular business or industry. Well, great. I mean, if it can do that, then maybe we can lower the temperature around the world by a half a degree and not flood my my native state of Rhode Island here, thanks to the rising of the Narragansett Bay. But that's to, you know that remains to be seen. I think there's always going to be a human element. How, how do these numbers, how do these figures, how do these fact, facts apply to me and my yeah. situation? I think that's yeah. always going to be needed. Well, speaking of the human touch or the human element, uh, a couple of minutes ago, you said uh, we're, we're always people are always going to need to read, reflect, and write. By reflect, I assume you meant think, uh, read, think, write. Now, that's kind of uh, a sequence. Uh, read or take in data, think about it, reflect about it, and then produce uh, some kind of uh, uh, reflection on it, write something or speak something. Uh, if we 
if we take out any of those steps, the reading or the thinking or the writing, what are we actually doing to the the human role in all of our all of our uh, social processes, all of our interactions? Well, that goes back to what people are taught in their educational foundation and critical yeah. thinking is one of those skills that we absolutely have to continue to maintain. And I would argue that some of that also comes through the teaching of math and the teaching of music, both of which use different neural pathways than other particular activities that mm-hmm. you could engage in. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that I don't know that right W-R-I-T-E is perhaps the best word, though I did use that. I think communicate that you just said yeah. is probably the better idea. And in that regard, I can only communicate that which I understand. Uh, and I, I mean, I could get up in front of a, a classroom full of students and I could read from a physics textbook. I could I could pronounce all the words and, and I could stand up there for an hour and a half and literally read off of a prepared script. But I would have the first idea as to what I was actually saying. And if anyone ever asked me a question, that would be the end of the discussion because I probably couldn't couldn't answer it unless I could say, you can find that word on page 218. <laughs> that would be the extent of my, my ability. Or just ask chat GPT. <laughs> Don't bother me, so, just uh, ask. So at some point, if we value human interaction, which we have for millennia, I mean, that has been the foundation of all of civilization is human interaction, then we have to keep communicating. We have to keep interacting. It's not going to be so insular that we can say, well, just let ChatGPT do it. Uh, That's not going to, that's not going to work because we still need to be communicating. We still need to be interacting with one another. Relationships really are the name of the game and they can be supported by all of these things, just like they can be, just like they're being supported by technology today. Um, But it's not where, you know, ChatGPT is not where it ends. Yeah, you just made me think of uh, the whole uh, issue of creativity. What happens to creativity if we're regurgitating things that have already been created over whatever period of time? We know, of course, that uh, Chat GPT can write music. It can produce a play or a sonnet or uh, any form of writing. Uh, It can produce images now. You can ask it to produce uh, any kind of painting and it can produce it what happens to originality in the arts now it just occurred to me though there's one art i think the chat gpt can't reproduce and that is dance i don't think it can dance yet well computer generated images can dance yeah if you've watched any movie in the last 20 years there are you know there are no dancing elephants in the wild they would be you know that would be computer generated yeah but, uh, but in you know an actual in, dance on you know uh, a live dance on the stage in front of you, I right, don't think that, it can that do that. Probably, Although it could it could certainly produce the choreography. Yeah, if it, it could if produce, it understood if yeah. it understood what that was, it could tell you you know five six seven eight here here's what you're going to do. Yeah, the same thing though is true with any of the arts when you when you boil anything down. Uh, I have a, a music background. That was my undergrad and grad training were in music. And oftentimes people will say, there are only so many notes in the scale. And yet somehow for thousands of years, we've been producing music where apart from a few, you know, highly publicized lawsuits, most songs are unique. They are distinct from every other song that's ever been written in the history of the world. And so the fact that chat gpt or some other music and they're out there now already absolutely they're out there now sure. background m- music for movies and that sort of thing i don't know how many con- how many composers are actually sitting down and with the pencil and paper and writing those things down as opposed to perhaps mm. playing something and then manipulating it electronically so that mm-hmm. it does mm-hmm. what you want it to do so there is still an element of creativity there certainly, uh, and always will be. The other thing too, uh, and I, I was a piano teacher for many years, and I would often say I can teach the science of playing the piano, 
because there is a way to hold your hands and to strike the keys. And there are symbols that you have to understand. It's a scientific endeavor. What I could not teach was the art of playing the piano. And that was something that was born of experience, all of those, you know, cliche types of things and the heartbreak and the disappointment. And it's, it's really true. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I am a different musician today than I was 40 years ago. And if I were to pick up a piece of music now that I played then, I would play it very differently. It would sound, if there was some way to compare, it would sound very different because mm -hmm. my life experiences have contributed to my artistic ability in indescribable ways. And I think that's always going to be the case. I don't think we'll ever lose that, that aspect of creativity. Now, when it comes to creating a graphic where you want a cat, jumping off a bed, onto a dog, lying on a rug, next to a fire. Yeah, I could type that into an AI uh -huh. generator and the picture uh -huh. will pop up in seconds. And I can tell that I want the rug to be blue instead of green. And I want the dog to be gray instead of brown. I mean, I can do all of those things. But somewhere along the line, my eye is going to pick up something. My brain is going to rearrange something in that picture that the computer is not going to do. I'm going to tweak it in such a way that's going to make it much more appealing or accomplish whatever task I want it to accomplish in a way that, at least at this juncture, the computer probably isn't going to be able to do, no matter how many instructions I give it. So I don't think there'll ever be, while there may be fewer people doing some of those jobs, I have heard that you know computer graphic people are going to be extinct in a few years. I, I just wonder maybe, about it. I, I, I just wonder. Just the, the idea that there's a there's a touch behind anything, any creative, any artistic endeavor that I don't believe at this point technology can replicate. Well, I think that's one of the key questions, maybe the key question, because that also applies to every field. It's the the innovation, the creativity. Would uh, Cezanne have gotten to his late watercolors if he hadn't gone through everything else from you know the 1870s onward? Or would any kind of uh, artistic evolution have happened if they were just plugging into uh, some kind of artificial intelligence? Well, I think uh, an answer to that question is look at any retrospective. A anytime yeah. you take a body of work from a particular yeah. artist, whether it's in a museum or on a concert program or whatever, and you, again, uh, you look at the the Beethoven symphonies, or you look yeah, at the works yeah. of Picasso, or you look at the works of Monet. And, and if you put them, if you, if you kind of line them all up chronologically, the difference is, is astounding. I mean, it's stunning okay. the difference from, from one, sometimes one year to the next, but certainly from one decade to the next. And again, it's all born out of life experience. Most of these people lived incredibly rich, full lives though they not, not many of them had any money to show for it, but the number of people that traveled to Europe or, or did all the different things and they, they rubbed shoulders with other greats and with one another. And all of those experiences contributed to some part of who they became and subsequently what their work became. So I don't see how you preserve that kind of development if you are using, if the process you're using based on um, using content developed in the past. You know, several years ago, there was a big de Kooning retrospective at, uh, at MoMA. There happened to be a recording, de Kooning talking about certain things. So and de Kooning says, Vel, uh, I, put, I, I stuck the newspaper on that to uh, keep the paint dry. And when I pulled it off, uh, that, uh, that newsprint stayed there. And uh, I thought it looked nice, so I left it. Does AI have the capacity to think it looks nice and so uh, leave it? I think whether or accident, not something... Accident. Where does accident come in? I think what if it looks nice, if it sounds nice, uh, all of those things are still attributes that only humans have at this moment. We will ultimately be the the judges or the arbiters of those things. And I think that's where the, as I said before, we're going to have to look over the shoulder 
of AI as it's producing all of these things to make sure that it is in fact doing what we want it to do or doing things that are going to match up to the that type of criteria. But absolutely, I mean, those things happen all the time. How many hours did we spend in classes trying to analyze the the mu- you know, musical compositions and where this chord came from and that turn and the and, and plotting things out. After a while, you think, well, maybe he just got tired and put a sharp in there and he didn't really mean it. <laughs> it's one of those things where we ascribe meaning to so yeah. many different things because that's what our minds do, but whether or not that's intentional. And can AI, I mean, can AI make uh, serendipitous accidents? I, I don't know. It's produced some pretty interesting things so far that are not always ra- that are not always grounded in fact. So who knows? Now, Maybe. can you imagine? Huh, can you imagine using AI? Uh, can you imagine uh, judges or you know Supreme Court justices using AI to produce a decision in a case? Well, I can absolutely see that. While it might not. It might not be the final, you know, the final three paragraphs that sets everything up. It could certainly be the 400 cases that are related that need to be cited to create the foundation for the final three paragraphs of the argument. I I could see that happening now. Now, what that's going to do is put a lot of law clerks out of work, right? But in fact, that could it could scrub the literature in a way that there are limits even to what a law clerk working around the clock can do or a group of them. So it might make rulings come out we'll take quickly. But again, uh, even, even if chat GPT, even if these programs produced for me a laundry list of all the related cases, it's liable to come up with a thousand of them when I might otherwise only cite a hundred uh-huh. And it may also be picking up on words and phrases mm-hmm. that ultimately are not related to what I'm trying to demonstrate through a legal process, and therefore they have to be scrapped. So in that way, it it might be too much of a good thing. Well, you know, one of the criticisms of Alito's uh, decision on, on Roe was that he cherry-picked precedents and disregarded a whole lot of other precedents that conflicted with the point that he was the conclusion he was trying to get to. So if you were you doing this, if you were a judge trying to put trying to justify the decision that you want to get to anyway, then you can just plug in, uh, give me all the decisions that, uh, you know, that say ABC and don't give me anything else. And then you could come up with all kinds of uh, precedent for the decision you want to get to and uh, ignore Absolutely. all the conflicting stuff, which they do anyway. But well, it takes them a some, lot more time. To some extent, they do. But on the flip side, the dissenting justices mm, could do the do same, the thing. same yeah. thing and say, I, I, I had to produce an outline for a workshop the other day. And the our partner wanted a workshop on bullying in the workplace that did not use the word bullying. And in fact, ChatGPT came up with a lovely workshop all about conflict and conflict management and a couple other things that that nailed it as far as I was concerned. They got it right, but never the word bullying never appeared in the text, even though as a subtext, it was definitely there. And since I know I'm evaluating this based on what the subtext needs to be, I can determine whether what I'm seeing is accurate, valuable, usable, all those things. So again, that's where AI might be able to produce voluminous amounts and and write and all that sort of thing. But I, my eyes were still needed. There was something about what I could bring to this particular activity that was that was valuable, even though I didn't tweak much of it. But I could still, you know, it still needed my attention. How different would that that core that outline that you produce? How different would that have been if you had done it? yourself without any AI assistance? It, it would have been substantially similar, but it would have taken me a lot more time to develop it. I, I honestly, I plugged in to chat GPT the parameters and I had a complete two session workshop in about 90 seconds 
including outcomes, objectives, activities for each of the two sessions. And when I was all done, I thought, you know, what I really need to go along with this is a one paragraph description of this workshop so that I can present that to our partner. And so I asked ChatGPT to produce a one paragraph description about each of the three workshops I had it outlined for me. And again, in less than 90 seconds, I had my three one paragraph descriptions and I was able to package the whole thing. And in, I, I can't even tell you, I think I probably spent more time cutting and pasting the material into a Word document than I did actually creating it. And so as a time saver, it was invaluable. And I don't have to produce these so I can hand this off to it. Once the, you know, once our partner said, yes, we like this, we're going to go with it. I could then hand it off to a subject matter expert who could take what's essentially an outline and create two, three hour sessions all built around the topics that we've agreed on are best going to meet our partner's needs. Now, I still need that subject matter expert. I still need that person who's going to lead those three hours and be able to speak eloquently and answer questions cogently and direct people's thinking. I still need that person. Without that person, this would fall flat, regardless of how much I had produced in, a, in advance. Is that person going to use ChatGPT to develop their, their uh, workshops? I hope so. So because then what again, will they be then what will they be doing standing in front of uh, well either on a screen or standing in front of a group it, um, Exactly though but if if I allow chat gpt to create the basic outline the foundation the activities then I can spend my time as an instructor I can spend my time then personalizing it to the group of people I'm going to stand in front of If I'm a classroom teacher I have a group of students in front of me 25 students they have 25 unique sets of needs. And I can yeah. either spend my time making sure that those needs are met within the context of whatever it is I'm trying to communicate, or I can spend my time generating the content to present to them and less time on how to personalize it so their needs are met. So again, this is where we want to harness the ability of AI in our programs, particularly our teacher ed programs, our business mm. programs so that people are using the tool effectively, and then they can spend more time on really what are the quality elements of presenting content in any context. They'll have that opportunity. Just as when mm. I was earning my doctorate, we had transitioned from using the reader's guide to periodical literature, and then you went and you got the microfilm and you put it on the projector and you scrolled through and you found the article. And then you realized after two sentences of the abstract, this wasn't going to be helpful to you at all. So you rewound the <laughs> tape and you put it back in the box. You went back to the reference library. You know, I got to plug in into a library search engine on the computer. And now suddenly 427 articles came up. So now I had an embarrassment of riches. I had to still determine whether or not any of those were useful or, or you know, any or none. Yeah. But what was saved was my time in physically locating the material. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what was saved. So I could yeah. spend my time actually processing and reading and then doing the, whatever the task was, whether it was making a presentation, writing a paper, chapter in my dissertation, whatever it might've been. I don't want to come across as, um, you know, I'm, I'm not shilling for the AI industry at this point, but it's one of those things where well, we can't stand on the sideline and toss stones at it, right? Oh we, no, we absolutely no. have to embrace it. The decision now is how, not if. And, and, when, that's been and the when. Same, and when. And that's been the same for every technological advance throughout history. Mm. How, not if. And this is what we're faced with. This one happens to be moving uh, a lot faster than, yeah. I mean, I remember my first computer yeah. in my classroom was an, uh, an Apple IIc. Yeah, and it, took me, it took me a long time to be in a school that had a lab where there was software that students could generate things. That took years. Yeah. This is really taking days. Yeah. And, and in some cases, if you, if you follow these things, Something comes out in the morning and something new comes out in the afternoon. That, and, and that's a, a substantial difference. And, and of course, it has a lot to do with all the 
things that have happened over the last 20 years or so. Now there, there are computers uh, on, in every pocket. So uh, the infrastructure is there for an innovation like this to just uh, take off like wildfire, which is which it's doing. Uh, and there's no question it's uh, it's going to keep happening at a there's going to be something like a Moore's law uh, in effect. Uh, it's going to double, triple, quadruple every 30 seconds now. Right. It's not going to be 18 months like Moore's law. <laughs> no, it's going to be it's going to be 18 seconds. The, pe- <laughs> the people who are in the labs yeah. uh, and in the classrooms and in the studios and all that. They aren't paying attention to the people who are saying no. we need to slow down. No. Um, they're looking for ways to accelerate. They're looking for ways to expand. And you know, I, I think the generation that's concerned most about slowing things down remembers the days of science fiction when machines became sentient and and took over the world. I mean, <laughs> and, and that's always the fear, isn't it, in the back of our mind? Sure. Um, how how many societies all I would posit have to identify an other so that there could be someone to be better than someone to be mm. ahead of someone to you know outdo and so in science fiction it was always the alien it was mm. always the machine out of control was the other and I'm not suggesting that that couldn't become a problem <laughs> who who knows there there have been cases where two chatbots talk to each other. They were given a task to, to speak to one another. They started out in English and eventually devolved, if that's the right word, or evolved into their own language. The conversation continued, but no one in the room could understand what the machines were saying to each other. Yeah. Now, yeah. were they in fact saying something to each other? Were they in fact communicating with one another? Eh, we I don't, don't know. know. We don't I, know. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it just turned into gibberish. And, but that's a concern. But that's a science fiction thing. Everything we have today, uh, how, how many times do you go on Facebook or you see a meme somewhere where they've got George Jetson and some device that he was using back in that old cartoon that we all have in our pockets today, the cell phone or something else, that goes, some other mobile technology. Uh, that, was the, that was the fodder of science fiction at one time. And we're there now. It, it's something that has actually happened. But there's a lot of things that are parts and part and parcel of science fiction that have not come true, regardless of how many times we've right. written about them. Let's focus on um, K-12 education. How is this? I mean, K-12 education is slow to uh, to adopt any new methodology, any new technology. We still have problems in public schools, in high schools, not having enough computers or the the Wi-Fi uh, is down or the Wi-Fi isn't strong enough for all the classrooms to be online at the same time. We also have a huge issue about individualization or differentiation of instruction because we have such a wide range of skills among the students that uh, that we have in public schools. How could you imagine AI being used in a public high school and to improve the uh, the, the practice, uh, the outcomes of general high school education? Well, it depends on who's using it, right? Ah. Uh, if I'm an instructor and I'm supposed to be creating differentiated instruction for the 125 students I see over five periods every day or every mm-hmm. four days or three days this week and two days the next, I all of the different permutations, mm. then I could re- I could make very good use of AI in lesson planning, very good use of how to how to present materials so that the widest number of students with the broadest level of skills could glean something from what I'm doing. How do we teach students how to use it? Well, that's where any tool comes into play. We mm. have had discussions about Grammarly or Excel spreadsheets. If I produce something and I teach a child, I, sorry, they're not really children, but if I if I teach a student in high school how to use an Excel spreadsheet, they don't cite that when they turn in their math homework or when they create a paper. They don't cite Grammarly as their editor, even though the tool is there and we absolutely encourage them to use it. 
Uh, I've heard that argument made for why we should just let AI run rampant. Uh, Grammarly can rewrite entire papers. So why, why wouldn't we just start out with AI producing the papers? Well, again, if the point of education is to create individuals who can think clearly, think critically, communicate effectively in a number of different ways, whether it's in writing, uh, orally, or through some creative medium, uh, then that's going to take skills, that's going to take teaching opportunities other than that which can be handled by AI at this juncture. But yeah. should we use it? Should we? Let's face it, it's there already. Well, uh, it isn't quite, in, yeah. Students are turning in papers at all levels of education. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if some fourth grader writing a book report on Peter Rabbit had to, you know, went to chat GPT to figure out how to do it. I, I, I think we would be foolish to think that we can ignore this sort of thing. But on the other hand, it's a matter of how do we use how do we use the tool effectively? I do believe that students should learn how to compute. They should understand the fundamentals of how mathematical computation is handled. But I certainly don't expect them to take out a piece of paper and a pencil and do it. They need well, to understand the concept behind it. But that's why we have calculators and Excel spreadsheets and those sorts of things. Just like I don't I don't take out a calculator to do my checkbook. It's all on Excel or my taxes. That's on somebody else's computer. It, it's a matter of how we approach these things. But we only have, and it seems like a long time, but we only have 13 years in most cases to make sure that the student we are graduating at the end of that time does have all of those foundational skills that will enable them to use whatever the technology is going to look like now and in the future to be able to use those things effectively. And that those skills to wow. me are far more important than whether or not they had a paper written by chat GPT. So what are the foundational skills? Now, you know, in, in ages past, there was the, the trivium, the quadrivium, there were all those ideas about what a, what a person should know what is our the anatomy now of a, an educated person? D does it matter? I mean, do people have to know grammar? Do people have to know how to spell? Do people well, have to know how to, you know, subject verb agreement? Because AI can take care of all of that stuff. In fact, word uh, can take care of all that stuff. Does it matter anymore if, uh, if students uh, know anything about uh, subject verb agreement? At some level, you have to say it probably doesn't, although I would think that you would want students to understand how writing is basically constructed, although we certainly don't need to teach nouns every year for eight years in a row, which we unfortunately do in many of our grammar situations. That's probably not necessary, but there is some, some underlying understanding of language, the function of language, uh, the construction of language that I think would be valuable. That's going to help me think critically. I, I won't be able to analyze someone's argument if I don't understand what the interplay of words is. And therefore, mm -hmm. I, have to, I have to have some understanding of grammar. I have to have some understanding of how language is used before I can begin to, to analyze it. And again, for me, it really comes down to critical thinking. If I can think mm -hmm. critically about things and I can communicate effectively that's going to, that's, I will be then, uh, at that point, I'll be able to learn anything, regardless of what it might be. I'll be able to handle any topic, any subject, any context, if I can do those two things. If I can't do those two things, then I'm, I'm limited. That's what the Greeks called rhetoric, right? At some level, yes. Now, there are, there are a set of skills attached to each one of those things. So then we go back to understanding writing, understanding argumentation. And but again, the idea is that those are foundational skills that will take me through, take me down any path and help me understand and apply whatever tool, whatever technology, whatever is coming down the pike. If I don't have those skills, then it's more likely that the technology or whatever else is going to essentially operate me instead yeah. of me operating the technology. The technology is going to operate you or the people controlling the technology are going to operate you. 
Exactly. You know, which is uh, the big bro- the big brother problem, which uh, I think is a real a real possibility. Well, um, and but let's not. You know, it, it doesn't always have to be sinister. How many of us walk into a very famous coffee shop that I will not name and order coffee by sizes that don't exist in the English language? Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we've been conditioned yeah. by how many years of marketing and the barista, quote unquote, behind the counter correcting us every time we ask for a large, a medium, or a small. And now I, I, I just know that one. It's part of the lexicon. It's yeah. part of our behavior. There's nothing sinister about that. It's as a matter of fact, we we chuckle about it. But that's not to say that things couldn't become sinister. And well, that's it's... where that's where the ubiquitousness, if that's a word, of technology can run, you know, run afoul. Well, you know, it's not just the, the sinister is one edge of it, one one dimension of it, but before you get to sinister, it's standardized. Somebody has set up this set of uh, sizes, this set of categories, and that's what you're going to choose from. I'll take one of those, one of those, one of those. And you you are not required to generate your own categories. I think that's, you know, in this whole area of critical thinking and communication. But, but pr- first of all, critical thinking is really the core of of all of it if all our algorithms are preselected how do we get like for how do you get to cubism if you're sitting there you know in 1905 and all you can do all, all you have available to you is the various styles that have been created up to that time how do you get to the leap of innovation that produces something like cubism or 12 you know the 12 tone scale or any of those innovations that have really changed things, or for that matter, um, Einstein's theory. I think what you're talking about is what we've raised a couple times here, and that's the human element. It's the human element. At this point, AI replicates. That's all it does. It's incredibly sophisticated. And it has a broad reach thanks to the internet, but it does not, in one sense, it does not create. What you're talking about is that next idea, that next spark, that next iteration, that at this moment, which again is why I have said this right along in these discussions, I don't know what the world is going to look like 5, 10, and 20 years from now that my students have to occupy and work in and live in. I don't know what that's going to look like. So I can't possibly be say I can't say to them, here are the discrete skills you're going to need to navigate life 20 years from now. I don't know what those are. So I have to do something in terms of foundational skills so that they can themselves discern and they can decide and they can do everything that they're going to need to be functioning in that particular, whatever area they find themselves mm-hmm. in, whether it's employment, society at large, their family unit, whatever that looks like. Uh, but I can't. I can't tell them, well, 20 years from now, you'll be flying around in hover cars. I have no idea if that's the truth. So why would I teach them how to fly a hover car right now? I can't. There's no sense developing a curriculum in hover car technology at the moment. That doesn't make any sense. But when the time comes and there are hover cars and they need to be able to do that, if they have all those foundational skills, they'll figure it out. They'll put it together. And the same thing that at some point, there's going to be a new musical form. There's going to be a new art genre. There's going to be new literature. Things are going to change, but that's all part of human evolution, both scientifically and creatively. That's that's how those things will come about, just as they have for millennia. The critical uh, issue is what are those skills that we should be teaching now that are going to prepare Uh, the next generation to make the kinds of leaps or the kinds of decisions that they're going to have to make when that whole next iteration of society has developed? What, What are the basic skills? Well, again, if you, if you go back to critical thinking and communication, if I can think critically about things, I can evaluate where something is right now. I can look at modern art. 
or I can look at modern yeah. music and I can see where it's, where it is right now. And then at some point I can envision it. That's the communication piece. I can envision it being different from that. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly there'll be another art genre. There'll be another uh, art era that launches or another musical era that launches because someone was able to communicate uh, because they could look at what is and they could decide it needed to change in some way. Mike, I think we have pretty much solved all the uh, all the big problems of the day now. Thank you very much. Uh, as always, uh, it's a very stimulating conversation. We'll have to continue it. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you know, five minutes from now, uh, the whole world's going to be different. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We would like to thank Dr. Michael Maripati for joining us this month for JFY Network's podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please navigate to our website, jfynet.org, which features a wealth of commentary, dialogue, and free educational resources, including these monthly podcasts, to support all educational communities. Thank you for joining us. For JFY Networks, I'm Greg Cunningham. Cunningham.